Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, as you watch this satellite animation from yesterday here, I just want to thank you for giving me some time today on Thanksgiving to watch my forecast content, because we have a lot of very important things that are changing in this pattern that need to get discussed here. So first of all, this low-pressure system brought quite a bit of soggy conditions into the Midwest and Great Lakes states as it moved off toward the north and east in the overnight hours. Just as you watch this animation, watch it start over again here. Look at the beautiful beautiful transition from open to closed cell convection here in this boundary layer, in the stratocumulus boundary layer right here in this part of the Atlantic. I'm happy to see that and no tropical development at this time. But I want to pause it right there and just address two things here. First of all, we can see the snow that's piled up here after the skies cleared out in Colorado and also right here in this part of Kansas where some heavy snow fell. But to be honest, the clouds I'm most interested in right now in this animation are right down here. Okay, if I click play on this, you're going to see them moving pretty quickly there. And that is indicating an important change in the flow of the adjustment that's going to be critical to not only the near term, but the long term forecast. I'm going to get there in just a few moments. First, how much precip did we get over the last 72 hours? Well, you can see here when we look through early this morning, that was quite soggy from parts of the Southern Plains through the Ohio River Valley all the way down actually to the Gulf of Mexico. We did get some strong to severe storms right in here around the Red River Valley uh, as the system took shape and thunderstorms that swept through the lower Mississippi River Valley. But let's look at this now in terms of how much snow we got out of this, because you can see here from our national snowfall analysis map, we did get here in parts of Colorado, especially as you go through some of the passes here uh, very very uh, high snowfall amounts but two look at this right in this part of Kansas then coming over to parts of Minnesota Wisconsin over into Michigan and all the way up into Maine some locations here lately that have picked up quite a bit of snow just out of this past system but this is where we really begin our discussion the map on the left here released today uh, or excuse me yesterday this is the uh, latest drop monitor map and what I want to tell you is the western part of the United States, as you can see here, has a large area in severe to exceptional drought. And it didn't change much in the most recent iteration. And I'm going to talk about what needs to change in order for this drought monitor map to look better as we progress through winter. And that's going to come over to a discussion of what you have over there on the right. So that is a time series going back uh, to the end of August that shows you vertical and zonal, the vertical and zonal integral of total atmospheric angular momentum. Now the key word here in my opinion is the word zonal. So we know we're looking at the flow of the atmosphere, the momentum of the atmosphere, but it's the west to east component I'm most interested in, specifically in the subtropics of the northern hemisphere, about 30 degrees north. Do you see how right in through here, over the last few months, there's a lot of colors that are representing below normal zonal flow. So what this translates into is an understanding of the jet stream pattern. And over the last month, it's really favored a ridge here and a ridge there and deeper troughing that's been over like the Canadian archipelago up into the Arctic. So the flow has been doing something a bit like this at times. Now what's missing from this flow is what I really want to be discussing with you. Because if I just rewind the clock to a time period where we had a strong subtropical jet stream component to the atmospheric flow, I got to take you back to 2016. You see, in this case, the jet stream was doing something a bit more like that, and the ridge was centered right here over Minnesota. In that particular case, this brought in a lot of moisture in through California, into the west. We started off that water year, which goes from October to October, right? So we started off, especially the wet season for California, quite wet. This has not been the situation this year. So why was I so interested in those clouds that were mowing over parts like the Baja and over Mexico? Well, it's because we're starting to see, look right here, some subtropical component to the jet stream. But it's not taking aim on California. It's going from Hawaii here through the Baja and, and also through Mexico. What's going on right now in the west is there is a trough that's sitting right in through here. And yep, it's responsible for some very cold temperatures this morning in California. But to be honest, what I want to be watching here is not only this trough here, but this broader one that's back over like the uh, you know Gulf of Alaska and into the Aleutian Islands. And then I want to talk about how that's going to interact with the jet stream that's down here to make for a very interesting start to next week. So let's get into that, okay? 
First of all, I'm continuing to favor the European model because right now there is a sizable gap, as I showed you earlier this week, in the performance between the GFS and the European. The European in blue on this skill map and the GFS in red. We will do a multi-model comparison in just a few moments, but I'm going to stick with the GFS, or excuse me, the European's pickup here on the flow of the atmosphere because I think it is superior at this point. Now watch these pieces come together. Jet stream level winds early this morning on Thanksgiving. Remember, we're watching this trough here and this trough here. The subtropical component of the jet stream is going to be critical for moving this piece across the country, and it's going to keep it south. Now, what am I talking about? Well, as I go back here and just watch the next couple of days, what I want you to see is, do you see this little shortwave right in through here? The subtropical jet is going to take this shortwave and begin to change its inflection right there. And at the same time that that's occurring, there will be, by the time we work into the weekend, a trough that sweeps now into this part of British Columbia. Now, these two features and their timing is going to be critical to everything with this pattern. So this is Saturday morning, getting through the day on Saturday, now into Sunday morning. And what I mean by timing is by Sunday morning, the southern wave is here, right on the Red River Valley of, of down here in Oklahoma and Texas. Whereas the northern wave is on the Red River Valley of the north, right here between uh, North Dakota and Minnesota, going up toward Lake Winnipeg here. Now, why this is so critical is because the lead wave is doing just that. It's leading. It's not right now connected on the southern edge of the northern wave. So what ends up happening here is the northern wave grabs that one, sweeps it around, kicking it through the Ohio River Valley, and as it does so, really changes the flow here such that we set up a stacked low sitting right here over parts of the eastern Corn Belt. Now that is the feature that I want to be getting to and discussing because you can see the behind it. Look at how wavy things get with a big ridge building into Canada. I'll tell you about that more in just a few moments. So what does this do? Well, we can watch it first here by going to the high resolution NAM model. So this was the low that moved through on Wednesday. We can see in the overnight hours last night, it moved on off to the north and east. Now, for most of us throughout the day here on Thursday, so this is Thursday morning, there's a little bit of light snow here in Utah and Colorado, also coming through parts of you know Saskatchewan over into Manitoba. Our low is exiting the northeast, so it's a bit soggy here early in the morning along the east coast, right in through this area. And as we get past mid-morning into midday, much of the day here on Thursday is benign. But I want you to watch right here. That's the first shortwave. Ready? I'm just going to play this. And you're going to see it skirt right through Arizona. And it's going to move right through New Mexico and emerge here in the panhandles. Now it begins to draw on the moisture that's coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. And to show you from, a, from this point on, let's go over to the operational European model. This is the zero Z run. So we've seen it to this point. There's our shortwave. As we go forward, this is now Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon and evening. You can see it starting to pull the moisture. The high pressure moves through parts of the Ohio River Valley. Now watch this low take shape. This is now Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon and evening. Very, very windy conditions as you contrast this developing low with the high that's pulled into the plains here. So the northern plains very dry in this scenario. But if you get over to the eastern Corn Belt, this is now Monday morning, Monday afternoon and evening. As that upper level flow pattern stacks up these lows, we could be seeing a multi-day event here pulling in snow. Let me just step you back. Monday morning, afternoon, and evening. Extremely wet conditions from the Carolinas through Virginia, then up to the northeast. And a very, very windy system taking shape here early next week. And it may stick around for a while. Because the low gets stacked up, we're now all the way up to Tuesday morning, still seeing snow from parts of Michigan through Indian Ohio, down into Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia. And then it just slowly moves up into, well, Ontario. And as you can see here, because of the vertical stacking of this system from Monday through Thursday, we're going to be talking about it next week. Okay, how well forecast is it? Well, the low as of Monday morning is forecast to be right here. All right. But I want you to see there's still quite a bit of spread in the ensemble forecast. While most of them are honing in on that area, the spread still tells you that there's going to be uncertainty in the analysis I'm about to talk about, which is what's happening with the rainfall to the south and the potential for those stronger storms here. And also, what about the snow? So watch this. We're going to walk back through the last several forecasts for snow, and I want to focus in on this area. So this was the forecast released 0Z on the 24th. Here's the next iteration. This is 12Z on the 24th. 
Now we go to this one, which is going to be 0 is the end of 25th. The next one, which is 12 hours later. And then here's our latest forecast. And we've now seen that the last four model runs have really honed in on this area as picking up the best snowfall out of this. So what we just watched here was the trend in the operational European model over the last several days, keying in on where we're expecting to see snowfall in through this area. But I want you all to be very careful when you look at these maps because you can see the numbers on the model's projected snowfall, but we can't yet determine exactly how much snow is gonna be in that area. I wanna show you this in another way. The European ensemble currently is picking up in this particular region here, the chances of grabbing at least a couple of inches of snow possibly better than that we can then use the european ensemble to say well what's the probability of getting at least three inches of snow which you can see is quite high from here through parts of ontario and up into quebec you can see that the probabilities here are 50 to 70 percent what about the chances of getting at least six inches of snow again the models are very keyed in on this region as having the potential for getting quite a bit of snowfall out of this so from that point forward though, what I wanna then do is I say, well, what do other models say? I told you we weren't gonna to look too much at the GFS, but if you look at it over here, it also in its latest run is picking up on this area as having the best chance at picking up some accumulating snows. Uh, the ECMWF again is over here on the right, just for your comparison. And I wanna tell you, the Canadians are picking up on it as well, the Canadian model. And the Germans, the Icon model, while it's a little bit farther to the east, it is also seeing the heavier snow in this area. So what will be critical for us to watch between now and this weekend is how the models continue to evolve with this. As I told you a few moments ago, it is all predicated on the advancement of the southern piece, that southern trough being out ahead of the trough that's sweeping through the Red River Valley of the north in order to get this system to stack up and produce this snow. If that fails to happen, you will not see this verify. And we'll be watching it throughout the rest of this weekend and the weekend. Now, after that, look at what the Pacific North American pattern does. At some point here, just as we begin the month of December, the models are forecasting the PA pattern to be four standard deviations above average. Now, what does that mean? That means the jet stream is going to be doing that. And that is a highly amplified setup. Okay, now I exaggerated a bit here, but this ridge that's pulling into this part of the western part of North America with the troughs that are to the south and to the east, well, this is what it's going to give us in terms of our precipitation pattern. That is dry across the west. With the first trough coming out here, could be wetter in parts of Texas and then quite active along the east coast with that pattern, but drier in the Midwest, Great Lakes states, and into the plains. And what I want to do to finish this part of the discussion is just say, over the next... 15 days because of subtropical jets down here and not there and because the PNA pattern shoves with being in its positive phase of big ridge here I do not like to show you how dry the western part of the United States is going to be which is where we started this discussion but active right in through this area and again we're going to target here for uh, early next week for watching the snow come around the back side of that low into parts of the Ohio River Valley. From there, I do want to mention to you what's going to be happening with the wind. So let's just animate this forward, and you'll see as this system comes through, watch here. This is now Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So let it play out. This is accumulated wind gusts. And as that system wraps itself up here over in the East Coast, we are expecting very strong winds. 30 to 40 mile an hour winds coming through on the backside here, uh, at times gusting that high, and then much higher out ahead of it. From the Carolinas up through parts of New York here, you can see we're expecting wind speeds at times to gust 50 plus miles an hour. So this is a potent system that's coming through. Now in terms of temperatures, I just wanted to point out that today, early this morning, we do have a freeze warning for parts of the San Joaquin Valley. And this is uh, could be hitting some citrus pretty hard down there, so we're going to watch that quite carefully. We have fog behind the low that exited here, and let's get right on into our max temperature forecast. Playing this forward, let's just see how things transition from today on Thursday into Friday. Mostly, we have a lot of warmth across the U.S., but as the trough starts to sweep through here, remember, we're going to see cooler conditions on Saturday here compared to normal over Texas and Oklahoma with much above average temperatures on Saturday here in parts of the Northern Plains where we're going to see a lot of dry weather for the next several days. As we then go from Saturday into Sunday and now into Monday when the low really begins to take shape, there's Monday 
and Tuesday. Look at how cold this air is going to be compared to normal as both of those troughs sweep together here over this section of the country Monday into Tuesday. From there, let's look at the 5 to 10 day pattern. So we see the cooler air that is in place here over the south and southeast in both models, while the positive PNA pattern starts to crank up the temperatures here in parts of Canada, especially northern Canada. And that's going to last out to day 15. So that pattern hangs on here with the cooler weather across the south and the southeast with the much above average temperatures here. In terms of the polar vortex, I would like to just show you one thing that I'm going to be watching as we get into December. I do see that the pattern is going to go from a single wave here to a almost a split wave. You can see that um, when it started off, watch the animation again, it's right here and then toward the end of it, the models are attempting to split this into two separate waves. Now that could be our first uh, disruption to the polar vortex. This does not mean it's going to connect through the troposphere getting down to the surface just yet. But we just start watching for these features to happen this time of year because they could be a precursor for a big colder outbreak that's coming at some point. I just want you to know that I'm watching it. What I want to finish with though is South America. I'm going to use the GRACE-based, so that's a satellite, uh, GRACE-based root zone soil moisture maps. 2020 uh, is up here in the upper left hand corner and I want you to pause it because I put there 19, 18, 17, 16 and 15. And the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that when it comes to a deficit in soil moisture, this is the largest I've seen at least going back over the last six years. So keep that in mind. From there, the MJO appears to have collapsed into null space. But we have some better evidence of where the best upward motion is in the tropics. I'll draw a line on it right here, where the trade winds over the next 15 days will be meeting some decently strong westerly winds in this area. It's happening here, and that's where we're going to get some good rising motion. So sinking motion in the central Pacific, but also right into this area as well. Now, what does all that mean? Well, over the next seven days, the upper levels of the atmosphere are suppressing convection into this area very, very dry compared to normal, and that is problematic for the soybean crop that's been planted in this area. It will be wet in northern Argentina here, but remember the primary growing district is right in through this area that I highlighted. Going into week two, and this is where we're going to finish up today, we continue to see the drier bias in the models through this area. This story as we enter December for South America will be critical to the progress of the soybean crop and something we must be watching carefully. Hey, thanks for giving me some time today on Thanksgiving. Hope you all have a safe uh, holiday here, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.